There are, for those who are standing, if you're more comfortable standing, by all means do that. If, um, otherwise, there are some more seats in the front here if you'd like to sit down. Please uh, please help yourself for sitting down. My name is Liz Archuleta. I'm the district supervisor here. You live in District 2, um, Coconino County District 2, and I'm your representative. And it's great to see some familiar faces here and some new ones as well of uh, folks that I didn't see back in 2010 when we had our last uh, flood event. We um, are going to be um, having someone do sign language tonight uh, for the meeting um, in case there's anybody who um, has, is hearing impaired and also it's being um, videotaped so that folks that weren't able to make the meeting tonight are able to get the information. Um, so first of all, I just want to say thank you all for making this meeting a priority for being here today. We're joined by a number of county staff um, from our public works department to uh, contractors that we have that are working on site. Um, we also have uh, folks from United Way of Northern Arizona who are helping uh, with individual um, assistance. They'll tell you a little bit more about that. And, um, and then we also have uh, Brian Klamaski who's here from the Weather Service who's going to speak a little bit um, about the actual rain that we had um, and what we have in the forecast. Um, Jimmy Jane, our county manager, is here um, standing over there in the white. And then Todd Whitney, our emergency manager is there. You may have seen him, as well as a lot of our folks who are actually running heavy equipment um, in the neighborhood. You might recognize some of the people around here, around the room. Um, so first of all, just really proud of how the community has come together, um, neighbors helping neighbors. I know there was a lot of work this weekend happening, uh, folks helping each other with sandbags, um, folks helping each other clear out debris. I really appreciate it. Um, our community comes together when we are most at need, and um, this is another time that everybody has come together, and I really, really appreciate that. We've had some people that have needed some assistance um, who are not physically able to um, either play sandbags um, or they need some help clearing debris, and we're trying to um, help folks connect them with resources. And so um, some of you in this room um, may already have been connected with some resources. So you're going to hear Brian speak about this. I don't want to steal his um, slides or his thunder, but um, what you're going to hear is that the rain that we had was an unprecedented rain event. It was a 1,000-year rain event, um, and that was preceded by two huge rain events the week before. Um, we had a lot of rain, so what you're going to hear is that this was extraordinary. and. Um, because the ground was so saturated in the whole burn scar area, the event that we had that caused the flooding, um, basically the ground was saturated, it caused a lot of runoff, and um, we're concerned that for the future in the monsoon season, so since we're just at the start of it, that there'll continue to be um, some runoff. But um, I was in the area around uh, 1.30, maybe 1 o'clock, 1.30, and I could see the basketball-sized boulders and the trees coming down Brandis. Um, we're having this meeting tonight for folks that live on Brandis and the roads off of Brandis. Tomorrow we're having a meeting for folks that live on Kevin's Way and then live on roads off of Kevin's Way. If you're here from Kevin's Way tonight, no problem. Welcome you here. Um, if folks couldn't make this meeting today and they live on Brandis, they want to come tomorrow, that's fine as well. But just realize that the focus of the conversation for tonight is going to be on Brandis and then for the roads off of Brandis. So we all know about the fire in 2010. Um, some of you, many of you in the room uh, lived through it and the monsoons that came right after that. And they took, and how those uh, rains took the life of two people, two children. Um, in those, one in the floodwaters, another child um, in a ac tragic accident um, where the family was trying to build a berm. And so we, um, you know, really, really am very, very grateful that um, people are safe, um, that we, we have no um, personal injuries. Um, that's first and foremost what we're concerned about is um, the safety of residents. And so really happy to report that. Um, after that monsoon season in 2010, 
Um, we as the county decided that we really needed to do something to address the flooding and to build flood mitigation measures. As you know, knocked on a lot of doors in DC and we were able to pull together about $30 million to uh, put together some flood mitigation measures, both um, on the forest and through the community. And so basically, when we built those systems, we built them for a certain capacity. There's no flood mitigation system in the world that's going to be able to handle a 1,000 year rain event. That's, that's just, we, we, we couldn't possibly build a 1,000 year rain event uh, flood mitigation system. So basically what happened is that those channels carried a whole lot of water and they carried a whole lot of debris. And then at some point, the trees and the boulders were too big and the channel overflowed onto Brandis Road. But I will tell you that if we didn't have those channels and we didn't, ha we didn't have that flood mitigation work in the forest, the flooding that we experienced last week would have been so much more worse. And if you can think of what it was in 2010 and just double that, that's probably what we're talking about because that particular rain was twice as much as we had back in that flood of 2010 on that fateful day. So today you're going to hear from our engineering division manager, Christopher Tressler. Um, he worked for the firm at that time who engineered the project, the, um, the flood mitigation measures. He now works for the county. He's going to go into a detailed presentation about how the flood mitigation measures performed. We're also going to talk about plans on how we're going to go forward, um, how the county can assist you, how we can help with um, debris removal and help you stay informed for future flood events. And so you'll hear about that, what the county um, is able to do to assist. And then after the presentations um, and after we have this short agenda, we are going to have individual breakout tables here out where the, in the bays. And um, we'll have staff on hand to answer questions and go into specific details about your property. So if you have particular questions about your property, the floodwaters on your property, we're able to get to the map and talk about your property at a very specific level. Okay? So um, I really want to thank everyone for coming tonight. Um, I look forward to visiting with each of you. We'll be here for as long as we need to be um, this evening to get questions answered. Um, so, you know, don't hesitate. Um, to stay as long as you need to make sure that you get your questions answered, and I'll be here as well. And so, I'm first going to turn it over to Brian Klamowski, who is with the Weather Service. Okay, thanks, Brian. Thank you, Liz. Thank you all for coming uh, this evening. Um, my job today is to basically provide some context and some understanding to the weather and the storms that happened um, on Wednesday, the 18th. Uh, it was quite an extreme event. But let's just cut to the chase and uh, just talk a little bit about what we saw. Can we take, thank you, take down the lights. Perfect, first bullet. It should be understood that in the, we have, a, uh, just go ahead and click. There we go. We had over 11 inches of rain in the area between the, uh, essentially uh, including and two weeks prior to the uh, day of the flood. Um, actually, that 11 inches virtually all came within three rainfall events, one on the 14th, one on the 16th, and one on the 18th. This is a tremendous amount of rain. To put this into perspective, in all of 2013, during that very severe monsoon season we had then, the peaks had a maximum of about 22 inches of rain for the whole monsoon. We had it within a week last week. Next bullet. Like I said before, we have three, had three large events, July 14th, 16th, and 18th. We really can't talk about the flooding on the 18th without the context of understanding that we also had significant rain events on the 14th and 16th, four days and two days prior to that event. Next bullet. Um, it was the greatest storm over the Schultz uh, scar by far that we've seen in the past 10 years. Um, this one surpassed most of the others by, uh, by uh, at least twofold in many different uh, 
parameters you could measure. And next. If you want to compare it to the first major flood we had in 2010, on July 20th, the measured rainfall rates, or the hourly accumulations, at several of the gauges was over twice the rainfall rate we had on the 18th than what we saw eight years ago on July 20th. And next slide. And the total rainfall that we had was almost three times what we had on that first event of July 20th, 2010. And next. So what I'm going to show you is a couple of the uh, rainfall totals of the um, rainfall events preceding July 18th. So next slide. I, well, I'm sorry. Just to kind of lend context, here's uh, the rainfall that was measured on July 20th, 2010, for the big flood in 2010. We had uh, three uh, primary measurements from almost one and a half to almost two inches of rain. The yellow shows where the heaviest rainfall was in the western two-thirds of the Schultz fire scar. Now let's look at the rainfall totals from the three events that we're talking about. Next slide. Here is July 14th. It's a Saturday, July 14th. Uh, this was an event that primarily impacted the northern, the far northern part of the burn star. Here's Copeland Avenue, Brandis, and Wahaki Trails right here. It stayed uh, pretty high in the drainage. This was the first major event of the season. The ground and drainages absorbed the precipitation fairly well. There were, to my knowledge, not that many impacts uh, to the drainages and neighborhoods from this first event on July 14th. Next slide. July 16th, we had a major event. We had uh, over two inches of rainfall and 3.9, almost four inches, again, high on the drainages of uh, almost all of the um, fire scar drainages here from uh, just south of uh, Wapaki Trails, Brandis, uh, Copeland. Uh, they were all impacted, but high up again. Um, and it seemed like the uh, mitigation and the uh, drainages were able to absorb this. I was in the neighborhood after this event and uh, did not see again many impacts in the neighborhoods. Now keep these images in your head when you see the next slide. The next slide will be the storm totals from the 18th. Let's look at that. Boom. Okay, here's what we're looking at. A very large area of over four inches of rainfall estimated from basically Copeland Avenue to the north, saturating the whole drainage to the west, from top to bottom. Primary impacts were the uh, Brandis and uh, other drainages just to the south. Um, this was an extreme event. Not only in the amounts that were measured, these point values here are actual measured amounts in the gauges that we have on the mountain, not estimates from the radar. The image, which is colored, is estimated from the radar to kind of lend an idea of where the intensity was greatest and the values dropping to near zero. 5.9, 5.2, 5.4 inches, 4.5 inches, all measured amounts within two hours virtually two hours. Um, incredible amounts. When you do the calculations on how common or how frequently you might see some of these amounts in two hours, it calculates to about a return interval of greater than a thousand years. Or to put another way, 0.1% chance in any given year. It's a highly unusual event. Next slide. Ah, let's get it. Next slide. And one more. Okay. This slide, uh, which is very illustrative, shows the one hour rainfall rates for our most recent event compared to the one hour 
rainfall rates all the way back to 2011 at four of the rainfall gauges that we have, the rain gauges. These are one hourly rates, so this is 3.46, 3.82 in one hour, which is a, well, highly unusual, very unusual. But you can see that it was over twice to three times the hourly rainfall rates that we had ever recorded in these gauges. Far surpassed anything we'd seen on the mountain from these precipitation gauges to date. Next slide. So it's going to summarize what I've already said. We're going to keep it short because there's a lot to talk about tonight. Next uh, slide. The measured storm total rainfall was up to 5.9 inches. Keep in mind, we average 7 to 8 inches of precipitation during a normal monsoon. Okay, 5.9 in just over two hours. Next bullet. Like the entire season of a monsoon? Yes, at the lower elevations, uh, specifically, let's say, um, at the gauge, which is on Highway 89 or at the airport, 7 to 8 inches during any given monsoon is the entire total. September from June 15th through September. We had all of that and most of it within two hours. Next bullet. Um, very significant to note, we had up to 3.8 inches at multiple gauges in one hour. I'm sorry, at, at one gauge in one hour. Next bullet, like I said before, this is twice the hourly rate of previous measured events there on the Schultz. Next bullet, return interval of these one hour rates is greater than 500 years. What's truly remarkable though is the next bullet here is the, we had three different gauges, not one, not two, but three gauges measure more than four and a half inches in two hours. The return interval on this type of uh, rainfall amount, the 4.5 in two hours, next bullet, is greater than a thousand years. And that's at three sites. So that's pretty solid evidence of this highly unusual event. Um, to put these return intervals into uh, context and understanding, they are defined as the chance or the return interval of that rainfall rate at a specific point. Not anywhere in the county, but at that point. So a 100-year return interval would be a 1% chance at your location in a given year. Okay. These 1,000-year estimated frequencies, they're all estimates, because of course we don't have measurements that go back a thousand years, is a 0.1% chance of this happening any given year. All right, and with that, uh, I'm finished with my presentation. Okay. Okay, if we let that go, can we just see how bad it is if that um, covers there? Is it <laughs> I think for questions that will wait until we break out into the bay, and uh, uh, Brian will be around and the other presenters will be around, uh, so you'll get a chance to ask questions if you like. But, uh, my name is Christopher Tressler. I'm with uh, Coconino County in the Engineering Department, the Engineering Division Manager, and uh, I want to talk about the flood impacts that uh, we saw as a result of this rainfall event. Do we have a point? We do. Make sure you speak loud, okay? Yeah. Can I advance the slide? Or is yeah. it to... So we're skipping ahead here to... If we look at uh, Highway 89 runs mostly uh, north and south in the area, if we start at the northern end of Highway 89 
and we look at the Wapaki Trails neighborhood. The forest, we had mit uh, flood mitigation measures in the forest, and that area received almost a 100-year rainfall event. The, the Brandis and Thames drainages, just we call it the, the Thames drainage uh, ends or, uh, or uh, drains into the top of the Brandis channel. And so Brian was talking about it received a thousand, uh, thousand year rainfall event, and that's a mitigated watershed, meaning that uh, there's measures up there, you've probably seen them, those log rundowns where we uh, created a, an alluvial fan or recreated the alluvial fan to get water to spread out. The next watershed down is the Peaceful Way watershed, and that drains into Copeland and Kevin's Way, and that's an uh, unmitigated watershed. The, and that did receive a uh, thousand year rainfall event. Further down, the, the southern drainages, Campbell, and the paintbrush, north paintbrush, south paintbrush, those still received about a 50 year rainfall event. When we designed these measures, we designed them to handle, when the, when the forest has some restoration to it, has some recovery to it, excuse me, that they can handle about the 25 year event when there's full recovery. We saw a 50 year rainfall event, and we didn't get a lot of flooding in those uh, neighborhoods down there. If you notice, you might have seen the Campbell Channel where it only had about a foot of water in it. So we were able to mitigate a lot of the flood impacts in the forest that didn't negatively impact the residential area when we were only up to a 50 year event. So let's, let's march down uh, the Brandis Channel and let's look at uh, what we saw. We don't have pictures of everywhere because the, the rainfall is coming down. Uh, but this is part way down around Glen Street. And you can see here that this is supposed to be a bridge. And uh, our channel got blocked. And uh, the flow came out. Some of it continued north, and some of it went back down uh, into the channel and, and conveyed its way down or uh, flowed its way down. So here's further down, closer to Highway 89, where this is maybe on the receding limb of the flow, the, the, the peak is past. And you can see that there was uh, debris on Brandis Way, <coughs> but we're largely contained now to the Brandis Channel. We didn't, there was not even a channel there before uh, the mitigation measures. So this, this all would have gone into the residential neighborhoods down there by El Dorado and uh, potentially flowed across Highway 89. So this is look. This is at the where Highway 89 and Brandis Lane come together, and the water comes out of that structure in turns. This was a thousand-year rainfall event. I'm not sure what the discharge event was. They're they're kind of two different things, but uh, you can see we did spill onto Highway 89 a little bit, but we didn't cross Highway 89. Uh, previous storms, large storms, crossed Highway 89, and we flooded into uh, Fernwood. So uh, feeling pretty good about that we contained this large rainfall event uh, to really only one lane of Highway 89. Is that because the uh, logs blocked the um, flow further up? Oh, there was, was there was definitely logs and rocks and debris. Uh, I got some slides about that. Uh, let's talk about that in a minute. Uh, this is down the channel of Kevin's Way, and uh, water that comes from that unmitigated watershed, the Peaceful Way watershed. Some of it spilled across the Kevin's Way uh, bridge onto Highway 89. When we're looking north here, and that's the Copeland Basin over here. But uh, we got, again, most of the water into the channel, conveyed into that Copeland Basin, all that infrastructure to help meter the water out in a more controlled way. And so we, we were able to keep a significant amount of the water on, in the ditch off of Highway 89. This is the Copeland Basin. And this might look a little bit haphazard the way that it's flowing out of here, but it has a concrete outfall structure that ideally all the water goes through there and it meters out. It was, that structure was overwhelmed with logs and other debris. And this is actually an emergency spillway or a secondary spillway. So we stacked up water, I mean, several feet of water in that basin, and then it metered out into the Copeland Channel. And then here, we're looking back now north, and that Copeland Basin is over here. As you can see, we're not on Highway 89. 
we're passing underneath Highway 89 and what, what I call the, the Copeland uh, Canal and the Copeland Culvert. And then this is looking down towards Cinder Lakes. Uh, we got that water out of there without flooding anybody uh, once we got past Brandis Way. This is Wapaki Trails. So this is all the way at the top. They potentially received up to a 50-year rainfall event. And you can see that they don't have uh, out-of-bank flows. There's some of those alluvial fans up higher in the forest that we constructed, and uh, some of the trenches to attenuate the flows. This is the Girls Ranch Road berms. This water from Wapaki Trails ends up potentially in Fernwood if we don't have these, these berms and these channels that wrap the water around it. So things held together and things functioned uh, pretty well. This is the Campbell Ditch after the storm has receded somewhat. Here we're looking downstream. The, the gas station is, uh, is right here. It's cut out of the picture. So on this half, we're looking downstream. And this half, we're looking upstream. So this is the channel that has a concrete bottom to it. And, uh, it's carrying the water out of there. Well, that, that's what we saw as far as the overall picture in the residential area, how the flow came through, how our channels and our infrastructure in the residential area uh, handled the flow. I'm gonna talk now about the on-forest assessment of what happened up above us uh, in, in the trees, and we'll get to that debris. So this is what we call a restored alluvial fan. And it's a wide channel. It, uh, it causes the water to disperse, and so we get kind of a diffuse flow across it. Ideally, sediment and debris fall out, and uh, it's arrested up in the Forest Service area. It's uh, really important that this happens because our drainage infrastructure can't handle a lot of debris. It certainly can't handle a thousand year rainfall event. But uh, even if uh, a smaller rainfall event, this watershed would still produce a huge amount of debris. And uh, these structures like this, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty natural looking structure, attenuates a lot of that sediment ideally. So this picture on the, our left shows, uh, it's from a, taken from a helicopter. This is the alluvial fan part right here. And then this is what I call a single thread channel. This, this is transporting a lot of sediment and rock, and this is the more diffuse flow that we get. So you can see things are holding together. There's log sills, just uh, one log buried the width of this uh, fan to keep it from cutting down. It, it held together pretty well. So this is in a mitigated watershed. This is the Brandis watershed. And then right next to it is the Peaceful Way watershed. And this is the Forest Service boundary. This is the end of Thames Street. You turn off of Brandis, and, kind of snake through. So you see the flows uh, split here, and it's somewhat of a haphazard flow path, several different ways that it flows into there. That's uh, the difference between the, the mitigated, control, somewhat controlled uh, drainage network, and then the unmitigated, the alluvial fan. So following that down off of the forest, I just wanted to show you what it looks like in that unmitigated area as it makes it to the Copeland Basin. It's, in some places it cuts this channel, similar to what it did before. I think we've, if you've been in that area, you've seen that before. It cut those channels down again. It, uh, it erodes, it exposes utilities and, and water lines. And then it, it, uh, it comes into this, I think this is the El Dorado area. You can see this is Kevin's Way, and this is Highway 89. This is the Copeland Basin. So that water sh should flow into there, and it, it filled up, and it did a pretty good job of it. Some of the water does go down uh, Kevin's way. No, we didn't. It, it did right. not. Right, and there's a, I think there's a berm right there, and uh, and we're going to no, do some no. maintenance. No, it, it went between our houses. It went in between and the it houses. And went into the basin. Yeah. It never went into the basin. Right, it's, so a, a significant right. amount of water went down Kevin's way, right? Well, no, we went between our house and on the Freeman Trail right. and then down Kevin's Way. Right, right, right. Right, not what you said. never went into the Okay. That was a waste of money. Well, let's, uh... <laughs> Sorry. 
<laughs> I understand that uh, this flood is... Uh, well, we want you to get this accurate because what you just said was very inaccurate. Okay. So the, there's also the Copeland watershed that's flowing in from the side here. And there's water from Copeland that comes in and flows into the basin as well. Ideally, water comes through here and, uh, and enters the, the Copeland Basin. And the, uh, the drainage network and the easements aren't available in, in a lot of these areas to, to get us a, a channel and a, and a consistent flow path all the way from the forest to, to Highway 89 or the Copeland Basin. But, uh, you know, we're going to have well, maps. They, well, let, let's just be clear. So they, we attempted to get easements from folks. No, you did yeah. no, no, you, you did, did not. not. I never got anything. Well, we tried to. We had to get it from the, we had to get it from the top, from the forest first, and then all the residents then leading out to Highway 89. So if we can't get it from people who are against the forest, then we can't get it on the way down. So you have to do it. We have to, we have, to have a single, we have to have easements all the way through pictures of our damage. Okay, well all I'm just saying is that if one person says no, yes. then it, we can't, it but can't be you done. Have to have yeah, we have to ask if we didn't want to ask. Yeah. And there's a, in next door we have maps, and, and we're still here, the county's still here, and, and we still want to help the community, and even though this is an unmitigated watershed. I think there's still some things that we can do to help. And so we have maps in the other room, and uh, please come show us what you saw, and, and let us uh, trace the flow path through the area, and, uh, and let's keep the conversation going. Yeah. So in the forest, so I'm jumping back to the forest, we have uh, the results of the fire are uh, all these burned trees. And if you remember, it wasn't a quick moving fire that went through the area. A significant amount of the, the forest was burned with high intensity. And, a lot of trees. I mean, it scorched earth almost when the fire was gone. So these trees have snapped off now and fallen, and it really charged the, the drainage ditches or the, the channels with a lot of dead trees. And uh, so you can see it here. This is uh, uh, some of the trees that flowed down and were uh, captured. And this next picture, this is above the mitigation work that we did. This is upstream of our log rundowns. And, and the other work that we did, and, and uh, all these trees are uh, dead trees from the fire. Potentially flowed all the way from these steeper slopes up here, all the way down into the residential area. So when you talked about the, that there was uh, trees and logs and debris and things like that, and definitely so. We're, we're cleaning the material out with our contractors. Uh, Tiffany Construction and, uh, and some of the other groups, our, our road maintenance crews, and we're getting a lot of rock and debris and, uh, and woody debris as well. And that's what I have is burned, burned obviously burned logs from that, that little chunks. These are you know, 20 foot long pieces, you know, 18 inches in diameter of wood. That was your, that was your, your swimming pool that came down. Well, I have a picture, I have a picture of it. I have a picture of it. Let's look at it. It's so, destroyed what you did up there. Well, totally destroyed. This, uh, oh, this, uh, this log rundown structure here is a picture from 2013 after uh, while we were still in construction. This is uh, the upper log rundown structure uh, the day after the, uh, the flood event. Oh, so. on third, oh, but there's, there's more than one. There's more than one. Okay, I got a picture. I have a picture of another one. There you go. So here, here's the other one. Okay, so we have this log rundown structure here. And it's not just laid uh, on the surface. We bury dead mass like trees and we cable them to it. And these are cabled together. But the, the tip of one of these snapped off and, uh, and is, is down downstream. But uh, logs came down and tore up the trench all the way up. So you, what about all these logs up here upstream of the log rundown structure? So that. Uh, the, and so we're, we're working to, to rebuild this. We'll, uh, we're looking at different options. This is important because it collects water for us. What's that? It's not concrete. 
I don't know if that's an option with the Forest Service. How about your Oh, I agree. So this, this uh, trench is important because it collects water and sends it into a single thread channel. And that's what, uh, in, a, in a less severe rainfall event, will transmit the water or transfer the water through the residential area. So we need to do some work on this. Uh, we have uh, the contractors that I mentioned before already up here. The Forest Service is coming out with us and uh, we're assessing it. They've given us permission to get up there. Uh, it's pretty extraordinary that a county would be able to go into the Forest Service and do any work at all. It took uh, Liz and uh, some of her peers to go back to Washington and ask uh, and motivate them to say, hey, we know the problem starts in the Forest Service. And we know the work needs to start there. And it took a, it took a lot of work in, uh, in order for the county and the NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, to get up into the forest and do this work. There's only about two or three other watersheds in the whole nation that they've even attempted things like this to try to help people. There's people in Colorado that are still getting flooded out. And so I agree that uh, there's, there's some work that we need to do, and, uh, but the, all these trees, we just were overwhelmed with a thousand year runoff event. Uh, we just couldn't have built it. Would you say so, that was, this is more of a, a debris problem than an actual water problem? I mean, if it was just water coming down, yeah, everything but, you built would have probably worked fine. If uh, it's the debris, yeah. then it's a problem. But, but you can't separate. Yeah, exactly. you, you can't separate the debris from the water. Is Chris Duza here? Yeah. Uh, this is uh, Chris Duza with Civil Tech Engineering. <laughs> and uh, Chris has been with us since the beginning. I'm going to put you on the spot here, Chris. Okay. <laughs> the debris that's part of the runoff bulks the water up. Does it, uh, does it go like one and a half times bigger, or how much will the debris bulk? Uh, typical debris bulking factors after fire greater than two. So it can double. Yeah, yeah but I, I just want to keep in mind that this was a the thousand year rain event. So, I mean, I, just, I mean, Brian Kamowski is here, he's confirmed that. We can't, we won't build a structure to a thousand year rain event. We can't. I mean, we just, we don't have the capacity to do that. We won't do that. Nobody in, whether it be city, county, any entity is not going to build to a thousand year rain event. The standard is, uh, I think, a 25 year rain event. And so, I think you have to understand if you were here from 2010 to now, and I think that's um, basically. Year event. I think that last one, when it first hit us, uh -huh. it was an unprecedented 100 year event. That's true. Now it's a thousand year mm -hmm. event. Yeah, we have climate change. That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's every 10 years. That's true. Yeah. I mean, I don't think, what I'm saying is that we're not going to, we're not going to build anything to a thousand years. We're not going to see the record yeah. from a thousand years ago, so we know that it's a thousand years. Well, Brian is here. I'm sure he can. Hey, guys. What I'm saying is that basically for the last year's rain season, the year before that, the year before that, and the year before that, the any flood mitigation work that we did contained the floodwaters. And this is a 1,000 year event. It's not going to contain it. It's, it's not going to contain it. Flows exactly the same way they did the first time. I understand that, but not as heavy and no, not as much. It was the same. Okay, well, that was, that's your experience, and I understand that. I would say this for other I'll people, it wasn't also. their experience. I'm the one who gave the property behind yeah. Ostrich. Uh huh. Oh. Yeah. And I tell you right now, it's the same as it was in, in, in 2000. Yeah. Okay. And it's worth and you know what? Logs coming down. To, to that end, to that end, the engineers that did this work were tasked with not making it worse for anybody. And so we needed, yeah, it's kind of like the doctor's creed, you know, above all else, do no harm. Sure. So we needed to put in these measures in such a way that they worked, and then uh, if they failed, they wouldn't make it worse for anybody. And uh, so that was important. But uh, that's all I have. And so. I would really like to talk to people uh, next door, and let's. Uh, we have other people from the engineering division, and let's map out where we see the flood paths, and uh, and please help us understand uh, your perspective here. Yeah, sure.
should we get? Log one, one down, it's supposed to last. Well, uh, thanks for asking that question. That's a really, uh, what so. What was the question? How long will these rundowns last? Can we back up about the same? Please. These are sacrificial basins. So they're meant to fill in with sediment and then we walk away from them. It's a, the long term maintenance isn't financially feasible and uh, it's just not desired. And so as the forest heals and, uh, and we get regrowth and, and trees and we get interception up in the forest, we don't need these basins as much anymore. So these will go away. The alluvial fans that we have will persist, and they'll be enough. Uh, to, uh, they should be enough to handle a typical, you know, up to 25-year rainfall event. So these basins will fill in with sediment, and then uh, we'll walk away from them. That's a good question. Thank you. But it didn't say how long. Oh, it depends on how much sediment. Uh, probably 10 to 15 years. Depends on how many runoff events we get. How much sediment we get in? You know, you have this this area here, and it all goes into one channel, which goes down behind my house into Brand. Yes. The uh, I'm just wondering when you have all that water coming down, no matter whether you spread it out, you put it all back in, and then they turn it, put it at a 90 degree to my house. We don't want it. How do you expect it to go around? So there's that's a big trench there. And so the velocity, it goes into there, and uh, it's, it's a, a scaly basin somewhat, and so it, it goes into there and then flows outside. So, so we will, but uh, we're on it. Okay. I, I don't know if you remember me, Kel, but uh, we were on it together. Right? So, Steve, uh, from United Way, did you have anything you wanted to speak to? So... <laughs> Excuse me, can I, can I get Steve from United Way to speak? So back in 2010 when the event happened, we Wait. saw a lot of volunteers that turned out. And that, that certainly is, is going to happen again. Uh, what we're going to be tasked with is trying to match your needs with volunteers in the community. Now the two things with that is we're focused on individuals with special needs in terms of trying to meet their needs. We're also kind of at the mercy of the volunteers that are out there. We're reaching back out to volunteers that we had back in 2010. We've also made contact with some of the churches, some of the church groups that have a lot of folks that they want to provide some assistance to. So we're going to be, we have information from the call center. Uh, we'll be here afterwards in terms of individual with special needs. If we can identify what your needs are, we're going to start recruiting. We're doing the recruiting right now. We've got the, the volunteer registrations on our website. So we're actively recruiting volunteers, but again, our ability to connect volunteers to your needs is really based on, on how many folks are, are really out in the community. So we're out there doing our work, trying to get some folks that we're going to be doing an active recruitment. Uh, so please, when you can, if you've not already called into the call center, we'll be around afterwards if you've got, again, into, uh, special needs that we can identify. Now the scope of the work is going to be also dependent on the volunteers. You know, a lot of volunteers, they come with a big heart. But they may not have, you know, the muscles to go with it. And so our ability to be able to do as much as we can with flood-related debris removal, uh, we'll certainly do our best to do that. Okay. Thank you. What are you asking? Peru. P-E-R-U. Thank you. Steve. Okay. Mike, do you have anything? I'm next. You're next. Perfect. Yes. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Mike Lopker, and I'm Deputy Public Works Director. <clears throat> I'm here tonight to tell you um, how we respond, uh, how Public Works responds during a storm, and to tell you some of the resources that we uh, have for you that we'll be able to help you with tonight. So uh, next slide, Mark. Um, Public Works has a flood team, a group of people who are on duty um, all, all season long. We actually rotate that duty week by week by week. And then we observe and monitor the weather. We monitor um, the uh, National Weather Service weather um, from Brian. We monitor radar, and we also monitor the rain gauges as they're going off. Uh, we receive text alerts for those rain gauges. It doesn't matter what time of the day or night, if it's a holiday or a weekend, we're getting those text messages and somebody's uh, going to respond at a certain threshold. Uh, when we uh, hit that designated threshold, we respond with someone on site. Because even though the weather report and the radar say something and the rain gauges say that there's rain in the gauges, that's not always indicative of where the flows are and how things are happening 
and so we want to direct our resources to where they can best be utilized. Um, our team was on site Saturday, July uh, 14th, Monday, uh, July 16th, and also uh, Wednesday, July 18th. Matter of fact, uh, Christopher Tressler and I were up there during that storm on Wednesday, July 18th, observing what was happening uh, as it happened. Next slide, please. Um, as soon as that storm had subsided, the uh, Coconino County Sheriff's Office was doing welfare checks. Our first uh, concern is life safety. We wanted to make sure that uh, everybody was okay or that if we needed to provide some assistance, we could. Um, we also began the next day immediately with seven teams of two people. Steve Peru, who you just uh, heard from a minute ago, was on one of those teams, and we went door to door for whoever was home, knocking on doors and asking people, what could we do to uh, help? And this is, not, now, um, we, we found certain things, and uh, I'm going to tell you what that is, but that doesn't mean that we, uh, we got everything. We just did an initial assessment. Well, part of the reason that you're here tonight is so if we missed anybody or if something has changed, you can tell us what you need. But again, we were looking for life safety issues. We wanted to know if homes were damaged, property was damaged, and we wanted to know what assistance uh, we could provide for people. Next slide, please. So what, what we found that day were that there were three homes with uh, flood damage inside. We know there were other structures and outbuildings that were affected. Uh, nine primary structures requested Jersey barriers, and I think those were all placed by the weekend, maybe sat by Saturday. Two properties requested uh, debris removal at that point in time. Uh, and 160 properties, this is the map we used and we marked it for what people said. 160 properties, no assistance requested as of the, the next day. We had five properties that requested uh, sandbags. Next slide, please. Can you explain the, the, the illustration on the previous slide? You bet. Let me go back. There. So um, this is our map of the area. I gotta, I'm out of the camera, so they're going to yell at me. I've got to be quick. Um, here's Highway 89. and. Um, Here's the Copeland Basin, and so there's uh, Kevin's Way and Brandis, no, Brandis. Mm -hmm. um, and then the colored areas are how we colored some of these, um, these issues. Um, the, if there's three, one, two, three, I'll bet those are the three homes that have flood damage inside. Um, so, so something of that nature. That, that's, how, that's how we went about going through the, the neighborhood and, um, pardon me, and figuring out um, what we knew at that at that point in time. Copies of this map will be available after the presentation in big and small part. Next next slide, please. Um, there were there were road maintenance graders on Brandis Road during that storm. So they were that, like the old days. They were clearing the rocks and clearing the wood off the road, trying to make those roads safe and passable in case we needed emergency services up there. So. Um, they, that, that's part of that monitoring everything. That's part of our effect of monitoring that everything and then sending people into the field to see what's needed. Um, road maintenance is currently uh, working to improve access. It's going to take two more weeks before they're able to get through the whole area and uh, improve the uh, access up there, but they're working every day to do that. We have also um, hired contractors to clear the channels, to let our folks, the road maintenance crews, concentrate on the roads. Um, we have engineering consultants on site assessing the effectiveness uh, of the uh, channels and trying to sort out um, what we need to do to repair them. Um, and frankly, we're working to ensure flood readiness for the remainder of the season so that we can be ready when it rains next time. Next slide, please. One of the things, we know there's a lot of debris in the area. We saw it that day, we've seen it since then. And so we're going to make uh, um, certain arrangements to uh, help uh, remove that debris. We need you to move the debris to the edge of your property. And, uh, and if that, I know every property is not the same, and some people have fences and, or other, um, other things built on their property. So if you can't move it to the edge of your property, give us a call and we'll have somebody come out and spot a safe location where we're able to bring someone in to pick up that debris. I need to define what that debris is. What came down was, in really simple terms, three things. Rocks, dirt, and, and uh, timber, forest debris. And, and we want to separate it because they're going to go different places, and some of it's going to get um, reused. But the lumber and timber is going to go to the landfill, either, either 
by us, or if uh, I'll tell you in a minute how you can get it over there, or you can take it there yourself. So if you can move that material to the edge of your property, call us if uh, that's a challenge. We'll spot a location for you, and then sort it into those uh, categories for us. We could also take, if you had some wood fencing or something like that that would fit into a, a lumber pile, um, then we'll be able to get rid of that with lumber. The uh, lumber that we get rid of, it's got to be clean. So, so it, uh, we can't take a big stump that's uh, got dirt all over it. That's going to be garbage. But the clean lumber that was cleaned by all the water rushing by it, we're going to be able to uh, take that to the landfill, and they've agreed to accept that. Um, this phone number, if you need somebody to come and spot a location to put your material, that's a phone number that you can call. And we've got that in a couple of places. Um, we will not be putting dumpsters in the neighborhood right now. We had an experience with that in 2013 where they got loaded with uh, rocks and dirt and we couldn't lift them up. We had to go up there and empty them out before the truck could pick them up. They just, they get too heavy. And so um, we're, we're, trying to, we're trying a different method to be more effective and also to sort this material into its final resting place. Uh, the landfill will take flood-related forest debris free of charge. If you take it there, they will take it free of charge. Uh, until Friday, August the 10th. You need to demonstrate that you live. Uh, the map that the gentleman asked me to go back to, demonstrate that you live or have a, a water bill or, or a, a APS bill or a gas bill for a certain property or your driver's license. Um, demonstrate that you live there and the landfill is gonna let you in and let you uh, dispose of uh, lumber there free of charge. Ronnie, did I forget anything? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Just one clarification, please call the number if you want us to pick up the debris that you put at the edge of your property so that we can do that in an efficient way. Does that make sense? So if you intend for us to haul off your debris, let us know and we'll confirm that we're going to haul it off and we'll map that out in an efficient way. Thank you. Thank and you. what if you're not strong enough or don't have the resources like a tractor to move the debris? Good question. Thank you. So we have resources here tonight. I want you to, um, when we're done here, go out into this room and uh, we're calling those uh, special needs and we will work to uh, find a way to uh, help uh, move that material with you. That's uh, the United Way is here and, and uh, that's how we're gonna uh, muster some volunteers and, and see if we can help with that effort. Good, que um, good question. So Hanako behind us right here, she'll be in that room taking people's names and numbers. So if you, know, if you or, or you're concerned about a neighbor who you know needs some help that isn't here tonight, let her know, and we'll, we'll track that for you. That, that was an important point. Thank you. We, when we pick that material up, we don't want to jump back and forth around the neighborhoods. We want to go house to house to house like the garbage truck does. That's the most efficient way and lowest cost way for us to move all that material and the quickest way to get it out of your way. Um, next slide, please. So sandbags are available once again at the uh, Tumbleweed Store, uh, Summit Fire Station 33. It's really important how sandbags are laid, and there's a video. We have information to show you where there's a YouTube video for how to place sandbags to make sure they're effective. <coughs> we will do Jersey, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> I'm running out of voice, sorry. Jersey barriers by request. We have to identify where they go, make sure we don't run over your septic or your utilities or that sort of thing. And so um, please call, contact that number, and we'll have somebody come out to assess uh, placement of Jersey barriers. Next Can slide. they do that tonight too? Uh, right. Where's Chris? Okay, good. Yes, just let Hanako know <coughs> that you're interested. Again, Hanako, let Hanako know if you're interested. <laughs> She's your go-to gal tonight. Thank you. Thanks, ne next slide. Okay, um, that's it for me. That we're expecting the questions all to come, and we'll talk about specific properties in the door next door as soon as we get done speaking. Thank you. Hi, my name is Allie. I work for the County Public Works Department. A lot of what I do is resident communications during these moments where um, we need to respond fairly rapidly. So I will repeat, Hanako is a really important contact person. Please be sure to let her know if you have specific needs after you talk with the engineers and um, the subject matter experts. Uh, and, and you get a sense of kind of the bigger picture, let, let us know who you are and, and what it is you need or where your gaps are, so then we can work with our community partners to help problem solve that. Um, and, and many thanks to the United Way for being such a proactive partner. 
on that. Um, I also just want to make sure that everyone got a handout today. Uh, the cover is the agenda for this discussion, um, but there, the, there is some really important information on the following pages, so please be sure to pick it up. Um, one, some details about sandbags, details about uh, Jersey barrier requests, a description of the debris haul-off service we're providing, details about the landfill arrangement for dropping things off, and then also um, the contact information for signing up with the volunteer opportunity through the United Way. And then on the back side is a checklist. So if you plan to do your property cleanup and push your debris to the edge of your property for us to pick up, there's step-by-step -step instructions for how it needs to be kind of organized and where it needs to go. And again, be sure to call us and let us know that you want us to haul it off for you so that we can plan to do that in a, in a thoughtful, methodical way. Uh, really important, um, I want to let you know that Supervisor Archuleta is compiling all of our recovery response information into a, an informative letter that will be mailed at the end of the week. Um, but we didn't want to wait until the mailing to relay that information to you, so hence the meeting tonight. And then the information on our website. Mark, do you want to switch to the next slide? Uh, a few key um, opportunities for more information. Um, oh, also in your packet is some static information about how to build a sandbag wall, and then a little bit of information about the National Flood Insurance Program, just as a point of reference. All information that many of you have already, but I didn't want you to leave here without it. Um, I strongly encourage you to visit our website. As we get new information, we'll be floating it up there. If a resident shares a resource that seems like it might be helpful for someone else, we'll put it up on the web. Um, if, if phone calls don't work for you because you work hours outside of the typical work day, email me at, at schultzfloodrecovery at coquino.az.gov. I'll get back to you and I'll make sure that you get routed to the right folks. And then this is the phone number. It's different than the emergency call center number that was broadcast when the emergency operation was in, in place. This will be the longer term number for you to reach out to us over the next few weeks. And all of that is listed on your packet on the top of the second page right here. Uh, we're encouraging everyone to sign up for emergency notifications through the county program. We have computers set up in the back right now. If you're not already signed up, please do so tonight. You see Sam back there, the tall guy. He'll, um, he'll nav help you navigate that if you need to. The National Weather Service provides weather alerts. If you'd like to sign up for those, please visit their website. And then we actually have real-time rain gauge data available on the internet. So if you're interested in tracking kind of where the rain is falling and what the data and, and how that adds up and looking at it in the past over time, um, all, of the data, all of that data can be viewed um, at this website right here. Uh, and I encourage you, you know, to use, use these resources as an opportunity to stay connected and to get all the information you need to paint the best picture that you need to get um, resources. And again, my name's Allie. If you have any problems, just let people know <laughs> that you want to talk to me, and we'll figure it out if, if we need to close some gaps around certain issues or specific questions. Oh, and I have one more slide. Oh, and so this is um, just a reminder. When we talk about emergency preparedness, from a resident level, these are the areas in which we really encourage folks to, fo to focus kind of their preparedness. The alert notifications, establishing flood insurance, um, following or checking the rain gauges, looking at you know how do you best mitigate on your property, and then uh, using the weather apps and weather radio to kind of stay abreast of emergent situations as the uh, conditions change, especially during this monsoon season. And again, if you have questions or want follow-up, let Hanako know. She'll be taking notes and we'll follow up here in the next few days. And um, I think it would be a good time now for the subject matter experts to get over to the tables while Liz closes out. Um, and I don't think I have anything else. I've got a question for you. Okay, like if somebody needs to talk to you, they're more than likely going to have to leave a message. What's your turnaround time to get back to that? Usually within a day. I mean, usually it's less than a day, but we say within 24 hours, 24 hours is our commitment. Over the weekends, you know, we're closed down over the weekend. We'll see. If we have a high volume of calls, I'll staff the call center over the weekend. This past weekend, we had one call all weekend. 
So my, we'll see how it goes this week after these meetings, and I'll make the call on Friday whether or not we need to have people answering the phone. I might just check the message periodically to see if they're emergent or if they can wait till Monday. But just say business, you know, regular business hours, and then within 24 hours afterwards, fairly quickly, fairly quickly. I think that's a great question. And I'm not a hydrologist, so I'm not going to answer that question. And I think I just so asked all of them to leave the room. No, it's, so it's a question on repair. On repair. Yeah, let me let me I'll get let, it done. Um, we'll get Christopher back in here. Sorry, Christopher. I don't want to get wrong. And it might be So to, to repair the Brandis channel, as uh, we have some consultants coming in to identify, uh, did we just exceed the capacity of the channel, or uh, was there a failure in workmanship? And so it's going to take us a little while to assess it. We want to get it right. We want to do it right the first time. So we're going to open it up to conveyance so that we can still pass water. It might still have uh, some uh, extended maintenance because we don't have uh, the, the armoring we had before. So but in the next couple of days, we'll have it open and we'll be passing water, no problem. Uh, then we're, we're looking at uh, you know, the contractors, what it'll cost, uh, what the right fix is. Should we do it the same way we did it last time? So uh, <laughs> I can appreciate that. Uh, and so it'll probably be into this, uh, into this spring that we'll be looking at uh, solutions, depending on, it's all weather dependent, right? If uh, we can't work in there, if we still get monsoon seasons. The, the, the heavy rains and uh, depending on what our winter is like. But uh, we'll make sure that we're at least passing the water and it's it's not spilling so out. So the same people that did the drainage and all that on, on Fur, Fur Road and Camel Road, are they the same company? Uh, not exactly, not exactly. There's actually, uh, out of fairness, different contractors and engineering firms. We tried to pull from, from the community that the, as a whole in, uh, in Phoenix and in Flagstaff and the contractors. So different contractors did, did different places. But uh, Chris Duzo was here, and uh, he is he is an expert in, uh, in drainages and, and these things. And he's gonna help us. We have some other, uh, at Tiffany Construction, uh, we, we haven't had uh, issues with the work that they've done. Not that there's been uh, the workmanship problems, but we have top people that we're working with, successful people that, uh, that have a track record of success that we're gonna work with. There's a question back here. What's the status on the state of emergency and federal funding, and how does that affect the process going forward? Sure. So we declared a state of emergency um, this week, and what that will allow us to do is to try to recoup some of the costs. And so we've already been in connection with uh, the National, National Resource Service, um, Conservation Service, NRCS. They're the ones that funded um, a lot of the work that we did prior, and so they've already said that they would fund um, some of the repair of the channels. To what level? I don't know if it'd be 100% or 80%. We're still in, or less than that, we're still in conversations with them. But um, they're there and they're ready and they're, the funding is available from that particular entity. I don't know that we'll have enough damage to um, make us eligible for funding from FEMA or from other uh, federal entities. There has to be um, significant flood damage to homes and there has to be a particular dollar amount, we're still, we're still calculating what the dollar amounts are and that's why we need for you to report in to us what damage you have um, because in going door to door we have um, the assessments that we've done but now in case we missed anybody we really would appreciate knowing because that then helps us uh, go and seek uh, federal funding if we're eligible for it. But just, you know, the last time the, when we had the large flood, um, we did not qualify at that time um, for a lot of federal funding, especially like for homes. There has to be significant damage to homes, like total, like totally uh, said that they're, that you're, you know, they're uninhabitable. Um, and you have to make sure, it has to be several of homes. And so we didn't qualify for like home assistance. But because the pipeline broke, the city of Flagstaff's water line broke, then we were able to qualify for some infrastructure assistance. And so that's a really high bar in terms of the amount of damage, the dollar amount 
of damage to be able to get federal funding. And that's why we had to go knock on doors and, um, you know, basically go search for funding and um, meet with our congressional delegation and, and get that funding. And so, you know, we'll do what we need to do again. Um, that means knocking on doors again and, and getting funding. We will, you know, we will make every attempt to do that. I mean, we're, we did it last time. We'll, we'll do it again. We'll, we'll do what we need to do. Oh, at your home individually? No, no, no. Uh, well, dollars do affect, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's not necessarily, uh, there's two things that affect what we can do. What we can do on the forest, what we're allowed to do as a special use permittee, what we're allowed to do on the forest, on their land, and then also what you allow us to do as homeowners in terms of giving us easements, and then also the dollars that are available. That's what affects it. We have the Arizona Department of Emergency and Military Affairs. They'll be out this week assessing it with us, and uh, they'll help with that uh, you know, potential um, declaration or uh, assistance from the state. Okay, so um, I know there's probably some questions for everyone who has presented. I just I don't want to leave with without thanking our county staff. Um, especially those who staffed the Emergency Operations Center during the height of the emergency. They worked uh, nonstop, and those um, folks from Public Works who were out in the field and uh, making sure that roads were getting cleared as soon as possible, um, sheriff's deputies who were there to do some of the welfare checks that night, and also who had to staff the roads uh, to ensure that they were closed, to make sure no one got hurt. And United Way folks really want to thank them. Um, guys, we've been through this before. And, you know, like you, I thought, wow, we're going to breathe a sigh of relief, right? We've been through five years without a flood. It was like, Whew. But I have no control over a thousand-year event. You have no control over a thousand-year rain event. We can't build to a thousand-year rain event. And so for those of you who said, you know, you experienced the exact same thing that you did last time, we need to know, did you experience it the same way in terms of the exact path that it followed the last time? Did you experience the exact same amount of water as last time? All I would say to you, if you experienced the same amount of water as last time, you heard Brian say that that last event, the big one that we had in 2013, was one-third of what we had this time. So if you experience the same amount of water, that means two-thirds of that water went somewhere. And if we didn't have those that work on the forest, if we didn't have those channels, even if at some point they were breached, that water would have been on your property and on Highway 89. You know that. You know how many times I had to close the highway last in that whole flood season, that whole water season of 2013. So if you're telling me you experienced the same amount of water, you have to ask yourself if three times as much water came down this time, then where did that water go? It went in those channels and it went in those flood mitigation measures. So I'm available. I said we'll stay here till we need to stay here to get all the questions answered. Thank you so much for coming. We're going to move on in here. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.